And along with our co-sponsor, Bosca, and our instructor, I want to welcome you all to our class. So before they begin the program, I'm going to provide some guidelines for successful participation in the webinar. First of all, all attendees are muted by default to reduce the background noise to the presentation. Awinika, can you go to the next slide? Yes. Um, so there's two ways that you guys can ask questions here. During the presentation, if you could type your question into the Q&A, then um, if it's about something related to rebates or um, specific to our agencies, Michelle and I will respond right away. If it's a question for Winita related to the conversation, we will um, bring it up to her during the, during the class tonight. And then at the end of the um, talk, Winita is going to stay around for more Q&A and you can raise your hand and then I'll unmute you so you can ask your question directly to Winita. And this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Bosco website. So first of all, I want to share a little background information on the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, also known as Bosca. Bosca represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, a water company, a university, and all of them purchase water from the San Francisco Regional Water System. Bosca member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo County. So the goal of Bosca is to ensure a reliability source of high quality water at a fair price for, for um, the agencies and their customers. Consistent with that goal, Bosca provides a regional water conservation yeah. program to support agencies in improving water use efficiency. The landscape education program, which is holding these classes, is an, is an element of that. While we have made significant strides in water use efficiency, there's still more room for improvement, especially on the outdoor water use side. So reducing outdoor water use um, through water efficient plants and innovative techniques such as the drought tolerant habitat gardens that you will learn about tonight can help us conserve water and ensure that future water supply um, will be there for our communities. So I want to share with you some additional conservation programs that may be of interest to you. So first of all, for any of our attendees that live in Milpitas, we have worked with Valley Water to offer several different conservation rebate programs. So we have the landscape rebate program. Within this, there's the um, lawn conversion rebate, which you get $2 per square foot of lawn that is replaced with drought tolerant plants. There are also is irrigation equipment upgrades and rainwater capture rebates, including rain barrels, rain gardens, and cisterns. And then I also want to promote that while we're all sheltering in place, we have uh, with Valley Water, there's a water wise indoor survey kit, which you can take your kids and try to find leaks around the house and check your toilets and your sink to make sure that you are not wasting any water. So you can learn more about all these programs and more at savewatermilpitas.org. And then uh, Michelle, do you want to talk about Hayward's rebates? Yeah, so um, basically the goals of our um, the Hayward water conservation programs, basically to take all the information you learn in these um, landscaping educational classes and apply them in your own home, in your backyard, your balcony, whatever it is. Um, so we do offer additionally the long conversion rebate program as well. Um, the different rebate amounts are listed in this slide, um, depending on whether it's a front yard, a backyard, an additional um, rebate for sheet mulching. Um, we are working towards offering some online videos to demonstrate how to do sheet mulching as well. Um, in addition, we also have uh, free low flow water fixtures for all residents of Hayward and businesses that can pick up at City Hall when we're not sheltering in place. 
um, and we also offer rain barrel rebate programs. We're also um, developing some new programs to help residents and businesses also monitor their water usage in real time. Um, and that's still being developed. And um, if you have any questions about any of these programs, you can feel free to go to our website um, down below in that slide, or feel free to reach out to any of us and we can direct you. Great. And um, if you're from a different FOSCA agency, then there are several other programs that agencies can take part in through BOSCA. So there is the Lawn Be Gone program, which base is the, similar to the lawn conversion rebates we have talked about, um, which offers one to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced, well, as long as it's replaced with water efficient landscaping. There's also the rain barrel rebate, which provides rebates of up to $100 for purchase and installation of rain barrels. Oh, Anita, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so a new addition for Bosca is the Ratio Smart Controller Program, which provides instant rebates and heavily discounted pricing okay. on the purchase of the Ratio 3 Irrigation Controller. This controller can be operated on your smartphone and normally retails for $280. Through this program, customers of participating water agencies can purchase a controller for $100 plus tax. Um, last but not least, look out for Bosca's redesign, redesigned landscape rebate program, which is scheduled to launch July 1st, which will incorporate Lawn Be Gone rain barrel rebates while adding additional incentives for uh, stormwater retention facilities. To, to find out if your agency participates in any of these programs, please go to bayareaconservation.org. Um, and if you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to join some of our additional upcoming webinar classes. Um, you can see the full schedule and register at bayareaconservation.org. Um, specifically, uh, here at Milpitas, we'll be hosting the Water Efficient Organic Edible Gardening class on June 1st. So hope you can join then, but please keep an eye out for all these other classes and there will be more additionally added because yeah, we're really excited that we are able to transition to, to online and that you all are able to join us tonight via Zoom. So I'm going to introduce our instructor. Juanita Salisbury has a PhD in biopsychology from the University of Florida as well as a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture from West Virginia University. In 2009, she established Winita Salisbury Landscape Architecture after working for commercial and residential design firms. She has recently turned her focus to California native plant pollinator habitats and in 2016 established the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, the first of five pollinator habitat gardens in Palo Alto. The gardens combine her educational background, the biology and behavior of food intake with design expression born from landscape architecture. Her focus is to research and educate about these habitats, as well as exploring opportunities to install more of them. And we'll just wait for her to pull up the, the second presentation. Great, Juanita, are you, you ready to start? Can you can you hear me? Yes. I am. Uh, my internet, for some reason, is uh, unstable, but I'll press onward. So thanks for joining uh, me tonight and um, being interested in drought-tolerant habitat gardens. Um, as Linda mentioned, I am a landscape architect. I also have a degree in uh, biopsychology. And my area of, of research when I was in psychology was looking at eating and drinking. And now that I do these uh, gardens for habitat, that sort of uh, focus has really carried over into um, uh, the way that I, I look at habitat gardens. And we do have a social media presence. You can find us um, on Facebook and Instagram at the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden 
and also the Primrose Way YouTube channel. We do have five pollinator gardens here in Palo Alto. Um, Primrose, Arcadia, Island, Gwenda, and Hopkins. And if you Google uh, pollinator garden Palo Alto, you'll end up with a uh, map showing the various locations. Here's Primrose, Gwenda, Hopkins, Arcadia, and Island Drive. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of the public gardens. And then I will talk about plants, why California native plants and natives in general, then what to plant, basic planting design, some things about pollinators, and then maintenance protocols. I'm going to be moving fairly quickly through these slides. There's a lot of text. So later you will be able to go back and uh, listen to me or read the slides if my audio doesn't come through. So with that caveat, let's jump right in. So our first garden, the Primrose Way site before, and I like to, to mention the Primrose Way garden because in every city there are places like this that can be transformed. And out of my own selfish desire for more garden space, I approached the city to see if I could transform it to a pollinator garden. And they said, show us your plan. That was back in 2016 and five gardens ago. So uh, we got it planted up that year. And this is what it looked like last spring. As you can see, lots of nice blossoms and color. There's another view of it as well. That garden has about 5,000 square feet, but really you can do it in a small cul-de-sac garden. This is the Arcadia Place garden. Very small, only about 255 square feet. But again, um, you know, every something like this, and why not, why not put them to use? So tonight, let's talk about what are habitats? What are the components of habitats? You have food, you have water, you have shelter, you have nesting sites. And so the question becomes, how do we optimize those components to make a habitat as productive as possible? And you always start with plants. Because plants are the beginning of everything. They are the primary producers of food and the basis of the food web. Some people like to call it a food chain, but it's actually more like a web. And so energy from the sun gets transformed by plants into things like caterpillars because those caterpillars eat plants and then other animals eat the caterpillars. And this is the uh, ma ba basic lesson for tonight, native plants are specific hosts for native larvae. This is the rule rather than the exception. This caterpillar doesn't eat ivy. It only has a very few plants that it will eat, and those plants are native plants. So if you want baby birds, you have to have caterpillars, and if you want caterpillars, you have to have native plants. So I call this my photons to protein slide. So with that in mind, uh, I always like to tell people plants are not decorations, plants are food. So I look for plants that have holes in them where tiny caterpillars have gone in and chewed them up. That way I know I'm going to get moths or butterflies. And we know that this is important because of research and science. and a recent study done by a mom of 70 native 70 percent native plants in a residential landscape was necessary in order to maintain populations of chickadees little birdies so um, native plants like scrofularia here and sedalsia and areogonum and uh, peridoridia give you caterpillars here we have a checker spot over here here we actually have a gray hair streak laying an egg on Areogonum fasciculatum in my home garden. If you like this butterfly, plant this plant. So why California natives? Well, because we're talking about drought tolerant gardens, we have to talk about drought tolerant plants. And because native plants are great, we're going to talk about drought tolerant California native plants. Most of our plants uh, that are the Mediterranean types are drought tolerant once they're established. So here was our Gwenda garden beforehand, and this garden was ivy for about 60 years. There's a big valley oak there, but this garden is not productive. This was a garden just about three weeks ago. Uh, we transformed it pretty quickly. 
Um, and we know that native plants are largely preferred over non-natives by pollinators. Bees like native plants, or native bees like native plants. Native plants depend largely on native pollinators for reproduction. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And native plants provide the right nutrients, again, for native insect larval development. So native plants are the way to go. Non-native plants can escape cultivation. And once they do, they're kind of like tumors in the environment. They get in and destroy ecosystems. And California is a biodiversity hotspot. We have more plants in our state than any other state in the United States. We have more native bees in our state than any other state. We have approximately 1,600 of native bees here. And we have so many plants and so many bees because of two things. We have a lot of unique ecosystems in California, and we have a lot of unique species of bees. These things work together to give us uh, our unique plants that we have. A lot of people say, well, what do I plant? We have a lot of plants. And so I have a couple of go-to databases that I go uh, work from. One of these databases is at the calscape.org website. Easy, easy to use, very searchable, provides just about everything that you need to find what you can do to create a palette of trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, vines, and succulents, and so on. Um, there's you, there's a link of nurseries, so you don't have to say, where can I find them? You can click on a link here. You can generate a plant list. Okay, and here I did a search. You can search by address or county or whatever you like. Here in California, they have listed 7,990 native plants, and they've broken it down for us. All plants, trees, shrubs, and so forth. I just took these screenshots from the calscape.org uh, website to illustrate these points. But because uh, I really am very into seeing how things work, and mostly because I'm very interested in things that eat, the question here is who to feed. And so we know that plant species need insects and pollinators to survive. We know that speciation, and what speciation means is that plants changing over time into various other species, happens more rapidly when you have pollinators like bees, okay? They spread around the genetic goodness uh, much more efficiently than if it were to happen by wind, okay? And so what that tells us is that biological factors then may be more important considerations to plant uh, for determining what to plant than things like climate or ge geology, water, temperature, all these things. So they also give us a list of butterflies. And here in California, the species that we have, we have 1,368 species of butterflies and moths native to California. Again, a screenshot showing everything and you can uh, find the host plants. So if you go through and you say, oh, I like this morning cloak. What eats morning cloak? Or what, what do morning cloaks eat? Birds actually eat morning cloaks, but that's a, a further up the food web. So where do you, Start. Once you have, you've gotten to the Calgate site and you're trying to decide what to plant, this is the easiest part of deciding what to plant. You want to start with your keystone plant genera, okay? So basically, there are certain uh, genera, the genus of plants, that do most of the heavy lifting in terms of feeding species in an environment. These keystone plants will form the backbone of habitat resources in the food web. If you have a plant that feeds 300 species, that is going to be a keystone plant because it will provide food for dozens or hundreds of other, uh, other life forms. That becomes a, a very important part of an ecosystem. And if you have a few keystone plants, you can then optimally enhance the diversity of resources. A lot of bang for your buck if you can plant an oak versus um, a patch of ivy, okay? Ivy doesn't feed a whole lot, but oaks do. So the takeaway technique from this is to plant at least a few keystone species in your habitat. So how do we find these species? 
start with trees. Trees are great. Trees do a whole lot of things in an environment. And because we're talking about drought tolerance, and I'll talk about why trees are good for this, um, start with trees. Here it is. Trees help save water, okay? Um, if you want to save water, plant some trees. Trees are great for cleaning the air. They form half of the rain cycle. They suck up water from the ground and extrude it into the air. They create clouds. They cool the, the air. Um, provide so many different ecosystem services. Plus, they're tasty for a lot of different organisms. Here's a California sister um, that I saw at the Big Basin uh, Park. A lot of cal California native trees are drought tolerant once established. Trees form hubs from which wildlife moves around in an area. And something like this big, beautiful valley oak can provide, or uh, coast live oak rather, can provide a lot of resources for a lot of different organisms. Everything from acorn, uh, acorns for squirrels and blue jays to uh, just dozens, hundreds of butterfly and moth larvae. Okay, and so California native trees. You want to get something that that's native for your location. Okay, and so let's do a, I did a quick search for Alameda County. Um, they have listed 15 trees native to Alameda County and under options, if you click on that particular button, you can rank these trees in order of the number of species that they feed. The one that pops up, number one, Salix laziolepis, the royal willow, and then the various oaks follow. Um, so if you can plant one or more of these in your habitat garden, you'll be way ahead in terms of creating a habitat garden that provides a lot of resources with just a couple of different species here. So I did a couple of different uh, looks at things. So I was curious and so the Royal Willow, Salix laziolepis versus uh, Cricus agrifolia to see the butterflies and moths hosted by Salix versus Quercus and 211 likely versus 122. Um, so really take your pick. Um, uh, Quercus agrifolia, the coast live oak is really big, so it might not fit. The Salix laziolepis actually works pretty well in the home garden. People say, well, isn't that a wetland plant? Well, well, yes, it is. But I have one in my own front yard in a side bed that I water by hand, perfectly happy. And I'm happy to have it because I know it's a keystone species, one of several that I have in my own home garden. So once you're done choosing your tree, you choose your shrubs, same thing. So and again, I've ranked them in order of number of species that they feed. And you can see that they put the arroyo willow as a shrub, um, and it can be form. Um, and then it goes on, lupins are great, and so on, ceanothus, um, lots of ceanothus, holodiscus, nightshade, the solanum um, umbiliferum, and so forth. Lots of different choices. So uh, our shrubs here, we've got a whole bunch to choose from. And these are three that I like to call the big three, Arctic Staphylus, Ariagonum, and Ceanothus. And they can substitute for non-native plants like boxwood and Raphiolepis, which feed probably two or three insects versus dozens. Perennials, you can do the same thing, rank them according to how many they feed. And um, these species that I have, like Phacelia, Circium, Mimulus, Penstemon, Aster, and so forth, provide a variety of floral resources. So lots of goodness out of the perennials and annuals. Uh, again, super easy to get a lot of diversity of resources with annuals. And people say, well, you know, I can't afford to have dozens of different species. You know, a one gallon shrub costs $15. My answer to that is raise things from seed. You can, you can buy a ton of different kinds of seeds for relatively little money. You don't have to plant them right away. Grow them yourself. That way you can get uh, great genetic diversity. 
you can get a huge variety that's not available in nursery nurseries and um, you can uh, store the seeds for later use so seeds are a great way to go for both annuals and perennials and I know that I might have some people who are not in California listening tonight um, and there are also other people who want to cross-reference with another uh, database so if you want to look to see what plants feed the most insects the National Wildlife Federation has a native plant finder another database that's easily searchable that you search by zip code to find the plants that host the highest numbers of butterflies and moths and uh, wonderful resource to use and I just wanted to see host 328 species which I think definitely qualifies as a keystone species all right so that's how you find your plants you look for the most bang for your buck in terms of what's going to feed the most and work your way down in terms of what's going to fit now in terms of drought tolerance this is a screenshot that I took from the calscape.org planting guide page and it shows you that here we have our keystone species here okay and these species, keystone species like the oak have these deep tap roots that pull up water from the ground table or irrigated areas and then they transfer it through surface roots to other plants okay so you can get deep rooted plants sharing water. This, this is key. This is why I keep telling people if water and you want drought tolerant landscapes, plant some trees. And this is a little drawing I did. Communicating how you can really connect things in an environment and Bonita, so me, you know you here's the, you a it's a kind bit. of a exhaling the water out, out into the um was there a question uh i think maybe you could just go back to the last slide the last thing you were saying you cut out a little bit oh okay so i was just saying that you have these keystone species like oaks that pull the water up out of the um, the water table and here in Palo Alto the water table is only 10 feet down so um, you know this is a really great way to, um, to to save water if you want to save water in a landscape plant some deep tap rooty trees like oaks okay like willows because they will share water um, through surface roots and the the magical things that happen with the um, endomycorrhiza the uh, fungus that forms a symbiotic relationship with the roots along here they share as well um, so this is a way to really uh, um, take advantage of what's in the environment in terms of moisture okay so so this particular picture here um, this big fat black line here is the ground level and one of the things that really helps in an environment is to increase connectivity and complexity. If you think of a web and you strengthen each strand of the web, you're strengthening the entire web. Okay. And you connect then in both horizontal and vertical fashions here. And so let's say you create a swale where moisture accumulates. That moisture goes, goes down into the groundwater, which is then taken up which helps cloud formation and helps clean up our atmosphere, which I'm sure everybody can appreciate. You can leave piles of leaves and twigs. And I'm gonna stress piles of leaves and twigs, especially under trees. Please don't use leaf blowers. <laughs> I'll talk about that a little bit more. But you can trap moisture and create little ecosystems under rock and twigs. And what I find is that Shrubs that 
spread by runners, those runners will head towards moisture. So if you have a pile of leaves next to a shrub that you want to spread, you can direct its growth by simply having a pile of leaves. Those runners will go towards the moisture. You can interlayer things together. So in the swale, you might have a ground cover growing, and then you can have something like geophytes, our native bulbs. We have tons of native bulbs that grow here in California, planted in amongst them. And all these roots, will intertwine and hold each other up. In fact, if you plant even more trees, the tree roots will hold up together. So you're gonna have a tree falling over in a high wind because the roots will support each other. You can have vines growing up into shrubs. So lots of different ways to enhance the complexity and the connectivity. <laughs> Don't get scared. You can come back and read this at your leisure. But this is, what I like to call my habitat basics example in a yard that's perhaps 60 feet by 100 feet deep. And here's your house at the top here, the residence, the door to the outside with a window. And I would suggest everybody an easy, easy thing that you can do to help the environment is put blackout shades on all of your windows to decrease light transmission to the outside. Pollination happens at night with moths, but those moths are going to fly towards light and wear themselves out and waste valuable time going towards the light when they should be mating and doing things that moths do. And they will be eaten because they're tired from beating themselves against light bulbs and whatnot. Okay. Um, also, lights outside should be on motion sensors. There's no reason to have lights on outside. Okay, so let's say you have a couple of downspouts. Let those downspouts empty into a swale. Okay, I connected the swale together here. The swale then becomes a linear object in the environment. Um, and linear things in environment like stepping stones become orientation cues for insects. Insects aren't really bright. They tend to follow lines of things like edges. Edges are lines. So here are I have a little a row of some. And what insects do, pollinators, bees, is that they do what is called trap lining behavior, which means they fly the same route over and over again. Okay, so I don't like to change things too quickly for them. I try to keep it simple and also reduce the amount of paving outside because 70% of our native bees uh, nest underground. Okay, so in your habitat, aim to plant at least 20 species and several keystone species, okay? You want to have a swale um, of some kind because it's become a moist area, which then becomes prime real estate. And you want to plant at all scales. Start with your, your large stuff first. Remember I talked about trees. Then you can do your shrubs, okay? So here's a big oak. Here's maybe some heteromelis or toyon, red buds, Okay, prunus, maybe a salix over here. And then you can move on to your shrubs like ceanothus, lupins, okay, um, areogonum here, more ceanothus there, and so on. So once you get your big stuff in, then you can start layering in all the smaller things. It's just easier to do in terms of uh, planning for things. If you have to dig up a bunch of plants to plant something big, that becomes more work than it's worth, really. So once you have all this, remember, lights outside. See how dark your neighborhood can get. And if any of my neighbors are listening, I'm sending out a challenge. We put our blackout drapes down, keeping our yard dark. And I tell you, I go outside in my garden during the day, and moths are always fluttering out of the bushes. This is a good thing. This is what we want. So. A dark yard at night is good. You can have your lights on motion sensors. If there's somebody back there doing what they're not supposed to be doing, you'll know. So how do you do that? If you wanna draw your own plan, and I highly recommend it, it's pretty easy. Take a piece of graph paper, measure your site. And here we have a piece of graph paper. Let's say each of these squares is an eighth of an inch. Let's say each square then equals one foot. So the scale here, an inch equals a foot, or it could be a fourth inch. Uh, once you measure everything, uh, have your north arrow, um, show everything that you want to stay, 
hose bibs, fences, existing trees, driveways, and so forth. And then just go for it. By going for it, I mean what you want to do before, before you put the plants in, before plants go in of any kind, you want to add paths for structure and maintenance purposes. You can have a nice curvy path. You can have a square path because that will create planting areas on either side. So once you have your plant palette, then what you can do is draw in your plants as circles and show them at their mature diameter. And the various databases will tell you how big they get at maturity. And the way you get the spacing correct is the circles should just overlap a little bit um, or touch, just barely touch. That's how you can keep from over planting, okay? I always like to plant in odd numbers. It just looks nicer. And then what you want to do to enhance foraging efficiency so bees don't have to spend all their time flying between plants looking for food is plant in masses of at least three feet in diameter. This makes it much more efficient use of the insects time. They're not spending all their time flying, but they're spending their time foraging, okay, and getting stuff and then getting back to the nest and feeding their larva. Start with trees, then shrubs, then do uh, perennials, annuals, and bulbs, and so forth. And also leave bare dirt spaces for nesting. 70% of our native bees live underground. So let's talk about pollinators. Um, well, this really says everything here. Without pollinators, about 90% of plants on the earth would disappear. And this is concerning to us because without plants, we would disappear too. Um, the vast majority of work um, in terms of pollination is done by bees, some incidentals by other organisms, but bees do most of the heavy lifting here. And if you think about it, 87% of all plants, 90% of all flowering plants require pollinators to set seed. Wind pollination just, just doesn't do the job. So um, if we don't have pollinators, plants um, are going to suffer. And by that uh, logic, we will too. Um, and what we do know is that plants in the environment are a reflection of the pollinators that are present. And I spend a lot of time looking at what insects are doing, bees especially, on plants. What are they eating? I love to see what things are eating, okay? Because I, I think of myself as the caterer to the insects. So I want where you have the highest concentration of bee species in California. That happens to be at beautiful Pinnacles National Park just south of, of here. Here was one of many scenes that I noticed, and we have this dark blue, a delphinium species, and then the lighter blue being a diclostema. It's in mass, and it's blue. Blue is a preferred color of bees. So we have two things growing here together. A geophyte, like a diclostema, forms a little bulb, and delphinium. So design tip from nature. So some more habitat planting basics. We talked about larva. How do you pick plants for larva? Okay, and the answer to that was go for keystone species first. But for pollinators, and you want to keep your bees happy, you want to keep them being fed throughout the entire season, so your plant palette should include at least three species each of the early, mid, and late bloom times. So a minimum of nine different species. And that's because pollinators emerge at different times. Some come out in January, others come out in March, some come out in July. And if you have overlapping bloom times, there'll be plenty of food the entire season. What we find is that gardens with at least 20 different types of blooming plants is ideal for attracting a diversity of pollinators, but if you have between 60 and 80 species, that's even better, okay? And more is better because it takes a lot of pollen. In this one study, uh, they found that 85% of 41 different bee species required all the pollen from more than 30 flowers for one larva. Other species required all the pollen from over a thousand flowers. So that's a lot of pollen, okay? 
Um, so tip here, nature tip, the more native keystone plant and other plant species, the more resilient the habitat will be. This is something that we know. The more plants that you have in the environment is going to be better for the habitat. Okay, the fun part here, pictures of bees eating things. Um, so early blooming plants here in Palo Alto, we have bees coming out in January. This cute little bee is Bombus melanopigus, the so-called black-tailed bumblebee. Look how cute the little bud is there. She is on the Ceanothus valley violet. It's a big favorite of these uh, bumblebees. Why is pollen important for bees? Bees are really the only insect that feeds their young pollen for protein. Other insects feed their babies other insects. Okay, their bees are but every other insect, every other insect in the environment is a meal. Um, so I'm not gonna go on about pollen here, um, but we do know that uh, pollen is not created equally, okay? Because what you might expect, right? Because there's so many different kinds of flowers and you have bee species that vary in their abilities to digest different pollens. Some bees will specialize on certain kinds of flowers like asters, for example, or goldenrod. So a good takeaway tip here is to plant for pollen specialists. So look for plants that pollen specialists use. Okay. Plant for pollen specialists. Generalist foragers will follow. Generalists are like bumblebees, for example. This is um, Bombus vosnesenskii, the other bumblebee that we have here in Palo Alto, feeding on a lot of different kinds of plants. A generalist feeder. She will eat uh, Ariagonum grande root. She'll eat uh, the, the pollen from poppies, scrofularia, and so forth. Um, in terms of fluids, bees get their liquids from nectar. Okay, and nectar is also what fuels their flight behaviors. They need some energy to fly sugar. And there are some plants that are irresistible in terms of sugar, so you want to be able to have something there for bees to, fuel, you want to have something there for bees to fuel their flight behaviors. So plants that are high nectar plants like Monardella villosa, not only appeals to bees, but other organisms like skipper butterflies um, and hornets and moths and uh, wasps, all kinds of things. Wasps are predators, so they will come and eat bad insects from your environment. I ignore them. I welcome them because they keep um, things in balance for me. So the ability to carry pollen. And uh, here's a little Melissoides. She's got pollen uh, tucked into the hair on her back legs. But the ability to carry pollen is very important because they have to transport it back to the nest. And most bees will fly between 150 feet to 1500 feet between nests and flowers. So if you have a lot of pollen producing plants in your yard, bees don't wanna go far. You will have nests in your yard, guaranteed. Again, I take a lot of pictures of bees and other insects eating things. And so I love this. This is again, Bombus melanopigus. She's going after nectar, but you can see the anthers here on the ceanothus brushing up against her fur. And the plant and the bee have opposite electrical charges. So the pollen actually jumps onto the fur and then she grims it into these little um, packs of pollen and nectar and transports it back to the nest. And bumblebees spend most of their time foraging. They only spend about two to four minutes in their nest. Another small bee on Grindelia. Can you still hear me? I hear you, yeah. I don't know yes, we can. what just happened, but it looks like we're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was very strange. Um, yes, so, um, so here's a, as I said before, I take a lot of pictures of, of insects eating. 
And so here's a small bee, and they're using the antenna, antennae here to uh, taste the uh, pollen, so she knows it's good. And this is Grindelia that she's having a, uh, she's gathering from. Um, again, another small bee on Salve apiana, and you can see here the map to the nest. Like I said, I take a lot of pictures of these insects because I am fascinated watching things eat. And so my friends, uh, when we go out to dinner, are uncomfortable sometimes. But anyway, um, so you can see what they're doing here. They're going after the pollen. And you can tell that by where the mouth is. Um, here we have a small bee on Clarkia amoena, a nice uh, annual plant, which is uh, there's uh, specialist set like that one. Um, poppies, every garden really should have them. Everything likes poppy pollen. You've got tiny bees, big bees, and some beetles. And again, even a nectar plant like Monardella villosa provides uh, pollen resources as well. Asters. Asters are great. Every garden should have asters because uh, there are a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot, there are a few species that are specialists. Um, but it also appeals to generalist species. We can see that there's, once again, we've got a bumblebee. We've got melissoidium in there. That's how they carry the pollen. And I'm not sure what that one is. Um, Arctostaphylus and lupins for nectar. You can see they, uh, the, probably the tongue is way in there. They have a nice long tongue. The, the, the mouth parts here where the tongue comes out or out, that's how you know they're going after nectar. Um, Penstemons again for nectar. And notice the beautiful blue color. And for sugar, you can't beat Phacelia species. We've got Phacelia tanacetifolia here. We've got Phacelia blandii. And Phacelia californica. Three different kinds of Phacelias. Um, bumblebees love it very high in nectar, apparently. Um, also the pollen, you can see she's collected the blue pollen there on her back legs. And it's only the females that collect the pollen. The males don't do offspring rearing or any collecting of anything. They just uh, sleep in flowers during the day. Uh, as I was saying, male bees don't really do anything. They sleep during the day um, sometimes, and they mate, and they eat, and then they die. They don't live very long, a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. Um, Erigeron species, again, for pollen and nectar. A couple of B-facts. I'm just going to just say in general, blue for pollen, for nectar, uh, blue and purple for nectar, white and yellow for uh, pollen. Okay, so once you have your garden, and it's chock full of keystone species. You've got a nice dark yard at night. How do you keep it going? Um, probably the biggest thing, keep your weeds at bay. Um, irrigation. So to establish, at least in our gardens, we have spray irrigation that was already existing. The first year, the spray irrigation would go on twice a week for about 15 minutes and at, at about four o'clock in the morning once a week uh, for 15 minutes. So that's how we irrigate our gardens. We don't like to water on hot days or when we do water it's when it's cooled down. Um, I'm going to talk more about pruning but you don't have to fertilize. You don't have to amend very much. Um, leaves are great. We want to leave the leaves in place. We want to leave areas of bare dirt for nests. And again, I'm going to say, and I'm challenging my neighbors who might be listening, don't use leaf blowers. <laughs> um, whenever you blow away leaves, you're getting rid of all of the caterpillars that nest there. So leaf blowers are bad. Um, they also blow larvae off of things. They desiccate other insects. It's just not necessary. And I probably shouldn't have to say this, but don't use pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. Okay, something that kills something else no no need for that. So leaves as mulch, yes. <laughs> leaves are critical for a habitat garden. 
they are where insects pu do their pupating, okay? A lot of insects spend their time as larvae. Leaves with those nasty leaf blowers, you're not going to have any of those. You won't have and you won't have birds coming into your environment because there's nothing for them to eat. If you don't like the way it looks, you can put a one bark chip thick layer of bark mulch on the top and make it look like mulch layer, but it's really not necessary. So the tip here: leave your leaves. Um, leaves are good. A lot of other insects actually eat the decaying leaves. So that's, even though they're, they're dry and crispy, they're still food. Again, bare soil isn't, um, we try not to walk in the area where we have a colony because we don't want to crush the nest entrances. Okay, we have a big colony um, there. I say big because there are hundreds that live there, but the area is about two feet by two feet or so. So it's not like you don't get to walk in your whole yard. Just look to see where insects are buzzing about three or four inches off the ground and then they disappear. That's where your nest is. And these, these small bees actually do forage at the Island Drive garden. They don't go far. They don't have to because there's lots for them to eat there. Pruning decisions. Insects, as I mentioned before, are food for other insects. So they don't want to be found. So sometimes they'll pull leaves around themselves to hide while they do things um, they're doing. So some might be shedding uh, their skins. They might be eggs, okay? These are katydid eggs. That was on a dry uh, branch of Scrofularia. These eggs were eggs for months, months. Adult insects live a very short time in general. A lot of insects spend more time as eggs, larvae, um, and pupa, okay, than they do as, as adults. Some adults don't even eat. The adult life is all about mating and dying. All right, pruning decisions. Okay, people go nuts about pruning, but what we do know is that a large number of species nest in these hollow stems. So what you want to do is leave, if you have to cut things down, leave eight to 12 inches of stem in place sticking up from the ground because insects will lay eggs from the bottom up in cells, okay? Um, and then they, once they hatch and they fly out, then you can cut those suckers down to the ground. But this is a handy place for insects to uh, lay their eggs. A lot of insects do that. Some people the garden. No, you don't. If you want a habitat garden, you have to leave these spaces for the insects. Otherwise, you're just really creating an ecological sink for them to go and eat and then be killed, which is not the point. So as I said before, many insects spend a lot of time as an egg or a larva, okay? And um, this is also what we like to call bird food. Birds prefer uh, caterpillars almost over every other kind of food source for their babies, easier to eat. They're like little bags of soft nutrients. And so as you move forward with your garden, once you've got your keystone species in place, you've got your swales in place, you've got a nice dark yard at night, and you just have to have more plants and you're still taking care of it and it's kind of like your wildlife refuge, let your decisions be determined by observation and research. Look before doing anything. Look at things, really see what's going on. Ask yourself before you plant something, does it provide forage for local species? Is it a keystone species? How many does it feed? If it feeds a whole bunch, it's probably not a bad thing to have. How much water is needed? You know, once again, your irrigation schedule, getting plants established, we like to plant here during the rainy season. That's the easy time to get things started. Um, again, does the plant provide nesting opportunities? How hard is it to grow? If you can grow things from seed, you can have hundreds and hundreds of species in your garden for a lot less money than you can if you're interested in buying one, five or 15 gallon uh, shrubs and, and trees and perennials. 
Another thing to ask yourself, because we talked about connectivity in the garden, but how connected is your garden to other natural spaces? Okay, what's around you? So again, look closely before acting. Information doesn't reveal itself all at once. I'm continuously learning about new best practices, and tonight's talk incorporated a few new tips that I haven't mentioned before because I didn't know. And so I'm always looking for new and better ways to do things, always improving. And so when I was taking a picture of this Silene, and I was interested to see what the pollen looked like and everything, and later I looked and I saw this tiny little Katie did that I didn't see until later. And that's the nature of information. It doesn't always reveal itself right away. Sometimes you have to go back and look. And so with some final thoughts here, among the other ecosystem services these habitats provide, the more that you understand about these interrelationships in nature, your enjoyment of the beauty will be enhanced as well as your compassion for all life. And I will leave you with that deep thought for this evening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, Bonita, we got we got a good amount of questions. I was thinking um having them to the end would be a good time. Okay. So let's see. So we have a question about they're asking that they want to turn their front yard into a waterwise garden. Yes. And they want plants that look good all year round. Um, and they're wondering recommendations on edible and low maintenance plants. So um, most of the, um, the keystone species are fairly low maintenance. So say, for example, um, if you want something that looks good all year round, I would go with an evergreen shrub or tree, okay? Um, and evergreen just basically means it doesn't drop its leaves all at once. And so, um, you know, start with your keystone species, look for trees first, remember, the key to a drought tolerant garden are trees. Okay, this cannot be stressed. Look for a nice tree, that will work. Go to Calscape, go to the National Wildlife Federation Plant Finder and see what you like. If you don't see anything that you like, maybe expand the search area a little bit to a few other counties around you. Find one that you really like. There are lots to choose from. Find one that will fit into your um into your space you don't want something that's going to get too big a big oak tree for example that's going to get 60 feet wide is not going to fit in a small side yard um, and so oaks can be a challenge on a smaller property but there are smaller trees that will work um, shrubs i love ceanothus ceanothus there's so many different kinds um, and they feed a lot of different kinds of insects. They're one of those keystone shrubs, as well as Arctostaphylus. Start for something good. And in terms of edible things, I'm always looking for snacks myself out in the garden. Um, and so I interplant vegetable plants in with my other plants because I know that those will uh, be pollinated by the insects that are looking for food. And there are a lot of insects looking for food in my yard. And so um, things like tomato plants that are buzz pollinated by bumblebees um, go in with my um, uh, Vaccinium ovatum, our native huckleberry, which is a great shrub. It's evergreen, wonderful shrub, and it is in the full sun. And it gives you these little tiny uh, huckleberries that are basically tiny blueberries great uh, plant for uh, snacks uh, are wild strawberries, another great plant that you can be underplanted under the bigger shrubs. Lots of ways to layer in food things. I also have an orange tree in our yard as well as a couple of apple trees. And because I have so many native plants in our yard, these plants get pollinated very efficiently. So I end up with a lot of apples, I get a lot of oranges, uh, works well together. So food crops interspersed with your native plants is a great combination. 
you don't have to worry so much about insects attacking your food because you'll have other predators there looking to feed their young. Great, then we have a question specifically on the trees. So um, one attendee said they have a coastal oak and that it has a lot of bird life, but the ground beneath it, they can't have anything. They had to move their butterfly bush and coffee berry because of the shadow of the tree. So I guess what do you, if, when you have these trees, what do you suggest kind of planting around them due to the shadow issue? So there are things that do grow under oak oaks, but what you really want to have under oaks is um, you want to keep all those great oak leaves under your oaks. Those, those need to be under your oaks because what happens is the larva from uh, the tree will drop down and they burrow into the leaves and into the ground. Um, and so um, you have to have, if you want, if you have an oak because you like the butterflies, you have to have the leaves, otherwise you can't really complete the life cycle. So it's really a dead end. Um, leave your leaves. There are some things that will grow nicely under oaks. One of the things that, that I like to put under there, there's um, uh, Stachys albans. We have that actually at our Gwinda garden um, at the edge of, uh, underneath our valley oak that's there. Very happy. Um, there's Stachys belata which is actually a moth plant, moth, uh, a moth larval plant. Um, and that spreads by runners. That grows nicely under oaks. So there are a few things that will actually work under oaks like that. Um, and um, you could probably read more about that on Calscape. But leaves, <laughs> get your leaves under the oaks and then um, uh, some smaller things. Um, not too close to the trunk, but maybe towards the margins of the tree. Great. Uh, one last question on the oak trees is, what do you think, will they mess with the house foundation? It really depends on how close they are to the house. Um, you want to have an oak for, <laughs> farther away from your house. Um, and a single oak is more likely to fall over than several oaks because the, the roots won't have uh, neighbors to help support them, certainly. Um, so what I recommend for people who can't get a big oak of either a deciduous valley oak, which used to be 61% of the trees here in Santa Clara County, which are now 1%, sadly, um, are scrub oaks. Um, those are evergreen. They don't get that big. Um, and you can start them from acorns, you can get them into a one gallon. They grow pretty slowly, but they provide many of the same benefits as a regular giant size oak does. So there's a really an oak for every, um, every purpose. Great, another really good question we have is what type of efficient watering system you suggest? Um, is there a drip system or a other type of efficient watering system to not waste water but um, help these drought tolerant plants survive? Yes, so I really like uh, spray, um, even though I know that a lot of cities try to get away from it. And I like that because I've had a lot of uh, experience with different kinds of irrigation systems. And I water our yard by hand um, haphazardly, and everything seems to be doing just fine. Um, we have a small yard, but for a larger yard, I think that spray really mimics the way that um, uh, rain works. And, and in our uh, public gardens that we have, the spray irrigation, the, um, people like to use drip irrigation and you can, you can use drip irrigation as long as it's above the ground, but those emitters that you have are really irresistible to squirrels and they love to chew the ends of those. And for me, I always find those drip systems a lot more trouble than they're worth. I don't like to bury systems like uh, leaky, leaky uh, uh, hoses and things like that because I always forget where they are because they're buried. They're out of sight, out of mind, um, which is why I like spray because it pops up. I can see if it's working um, with a, something that is perforated um, 
along its length. It's very difficult to see if it's working unless it is on top of the ground. Um, it might not be aesthetically pleasing to be able to see it, but I would much rather see my irrigation system so I know that it's actually working. I have a very hands-on approach. I think a lot of times people will put their irrigation system on timers and that really, you know, it, it doesn't really work in a habitat garden to have, you know, it's like sort of like a robotic system because it's not really what it's about. Um, even though we do have our public gardens on um, a spray that is on a timer, um, it's very limited. Um, and I do go out and check once a week um, on the days that I know that the irrigation went on to make sure that it's actually working and also the city people uh, check it when I don't think it's working. Um, so it's a, it definitely is a complicated question. I think that, um, you know, once your garden is in with your native trees and your other habitat shrubs and your recite, your kind of cycling, having, having a water cycle in your yard, um, hand watering works just fine. Watering once a week, maybe once every two weeks, um, works just fine. You know, um, during the hot spells, things might be a little bit more challenging, certainly for some plants. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost a site dependent question, but for me, hand watering works. Um, I, I do like spray. I know a lot of people say, oh no, we're only allowed to do drip. You know, again, you have to do what's allowed, but if you can, have a system that you can see how it's working is probably the most important consideration. Great. Um, one second. Let's, let's see. We have a question about how do you attract caterpillars and butterflies without them infesting your vegetable garden? So that's a great question. And um, so to, to keep caterpillars from infesting your garden is, and other insects is to plant a huge diversity of resources because that will attract a big diversity of predators. And those predators will largely take care of. Remember, every insect is a meal for another insect. Wasps, dragonflies, um, you know, um, You'll have lizards coming in, um, you know, and it's pretty much an insect eat insect world out there. So a diversity of resources, the more species that you have, the better in balance things will be. I don't use any kind of pesticides in my yard. The one thing that I do use around some plants is a little bit of sluggo because slugs are not native. Um, the ones that we have and the snails are not native and they can come in and decimate things and sluggo is a natural substance that occurs anyway um, and that seems to take care of things. Other than that, I let the insects, um, the predators, take care of uh, the in other insects for me. and. Um, apples. It takes a little time, but I end up in the fall with hundreds of beautifully non-blemished, organic, delicious apples. Great. Um, will mulch over dirt still let bees nest? Juanita, can you hear the question? Um, could you repeat it, please? Uh, Janet is asking if you put mulch over the dirt, can bees still nest? Um, they can, um, if they can reach the soil. Okay, you don't want your mulch to be so thick that um, they have a hard time getting to it. Um, in our public gardens, we initially had a mulch to take care of the weeds but the mulch as you know breaks down pretty quickly because organisms eat it um, and then we never remulched um, 
it's just for our gardens it's just not really necessary um, we might mulch our pathways at some point in time if that becomes necessary we do have stepping stones in some of our gardens um, but you do want to leave some places of bare dirt but it's surprising how resilient these bees are and how very smart they are I actually found a nest in my front yard in a shady location in the mulch where I did not think that they were. And so I thought, okay, I better not step there. I had stepping stones in between. So um, I was very surprised to find them there. Um, they'll find a way. Great. Um, we have a question about which season insects, including butterflies, um, will emerge from the larva or eggs? Um, so it depends on the species. Some um, have a couple of different um, batches per year. They'll, they'll have a couple of, they'll go through the mating and laying eggs and uh, turning into butterflies. Um, like skipper butterflies, for example, you'll have several generations during the season. Some butterflies have two generations. Um, some emerge, um, and it depends on the species. Uh, um, some emerge in March, April, May, others emerge later in the fall. So it really depends on species. Great. Um, what else do we have? We have a question about how to be fire safe when designing your garden of making sure that um, trees and shrubs are spaced out or a distance from the house. Are there any fire safety gardening tips that you have? Yes, so um, if you live in an area that say wildland interface, this becomes a huge issue. So you don't want highly flammable shrubs near to your house. There's, uh, for these particular residences, there's something called defensible space. Um, and there are certain plants like succulents that are not terribly flammable. Um, grasses um, can be flammable as well, but if things are moist, they're not going to catch fire. Um, and, um, you know, but it really varies in terms of like what's more flammable than other things. So things like junipers, for example, highly flammable um, because they have a lot of oils in them. Things like ceanothus, not as flammable. They're certainly more moist. Um, and they do, they are fire adapted though, uh, meaning they will re-sprout from the crowns as well as Arctostaphylus. Um, so there are, you can plant things closer to your house that are less flammable. Um, and, um, you know, just make sure that if you're in a wildland interface to have a defensible space. Great. We have a question about compost. Do you suggest using organic compost or homemade compost when planting native trees and shrubs? You know, you, you don't actually need to. Um, you can if you want to. Um, if you have a really good high quality homemade compost, sure, go ahead. Um, you know, it, it will get broken down and eaten by the detritivores in the soil um, and that can certainly help with the uh, relationships between the roots of your plant and the mycorrhiza that share nutrients back and forth. Um, I typically don't use uh, compost when I plant things. If I don't have enough soil, what I use is a cactus mix uh, because of the drainage issues. I like to have good drainage around the plants that I, I, I plant. And typically the soil um, works just fine as, as is. And I try, try to plant things that are as small as possible because I don't like to dig deep, big holes. So if I can get something that's in a two inch cell versus a one gallon, I'm gonna go for something like that. Or if I can start something from a seed and plant a seedling, um, it's just easier. And when you have five public gardens, I want it to be as easy as possible. And certainly in my own garden, um, I, I have other activities I like to do rather than dig big holes and work the soil and do things. I don't like to disturb the soil so much because remember bees do nest there. 
And so every time I dig a hole, I'm always wondering if am I going to destroy a, a nest colony. Um, so if you can reduce the amendments that you use because you have a small hole, that's probably the way to go. Great. We have a question about using leaves for mulch in a vegetable garden. Yep. Um, Why not? Yes. <laughs> go for it. Great. Then we have, when is the best time to prune? So um, the best time to prune is, and remember I showed the slide where I said, if you prune, like say you have something like hummingbird sage that has these long stalks of flowers and they, you know, they die back and they're unattractive. You can trim them back to between eight and 12 inches after everything is done blooming. And then we typically take uh, the stems and pile them up close by. Um, but do definitely leave the stems because even if they're not hollow, insects will hollow them out and nest inside and they'll lay from the bottom upwards. Um, and so when I, when I prune things, if I prune at all, I wait until I'm pretty sure that things have emerged. Um, and that for me is May or June, if I get around to it. Um, if you need to prune something like a shrub because you need to change its form, um, you know, if there's a branch blocking a pathway and you need it to be out of the way, I'll prune it right off. But I if I, something like that, I always try to wait until after it's done blooming and has, you know, set seed and the seeds have been collected or whatever let it do its thing, and then, and then prune um, for aesthetic reasons. Great. Um, we have a question about integrating a native garden with a fruit tree home orchard. Someone, um, this resident has trees that are about um, seven feet with a similar canopy, and they want to integrate a native garden with a vegetable garden. That's a, a great, um, that's, <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so again, in places um, on the perimeter perhaps is a good spot for some keystone species. Remember, find some keystone species. If you don't have room for trees, try to get some keystone shrubs like Arctostaphylus, uh, Ceanothus, and Areogonum, the big three, like I, as I like to call them. Um, they're easily managed. Um, you can do the ground cover form, you can do the shrub form. There's also tree forms of these various uh, Arctostaphylus as well as Ceanothus. Um, Areogonum, lots of different kinds there. Um, you know, again, um, one of the things that some people like to use, so Phacelia, uh, um, which is Phacelia tenacetifolia, which is an annual is used in orchards around the world because of, it, of its attractiveness to bumblebees and other pollinators. Super easy to grow from seed. If you seed it in an area, you'll never have to seed it again because it will, it's very seedy. It's very, very seedy and it will come up. It's a little bit irritating to the skin if you brush against it because it has little prickly hairs on it. But really it's a, it's a great plant to have in an orchard and it is used it's one of those plants that actually is used in orchards because of what it provides in terms of attracting uh, pollinators to uh, fruit orchards and, and other uh, uh, fruit, food uh, uh, growing sites. There's a specific question about Phacelia saying that um, it requires a lot of work. Um, and if that's something you suggest keeping in mind. Well, Phacelia tenacetifolia um, is an annual. I find that it doesn't take really any work at all. Um, it sprouts rel relatively quickly and easily. Um, it is used up very quickly because it's so tasty. Its sugar is wonderful. Um, and then it dries up really fast. And so you can chop the seed heads off right there and you'll have crop after crop. You can get two crops the Phacelia tenacetifolia um, per year if you just uh, water the second crop. You can get a second crop going pretty easily. 
Other facilias like the Facilia Californica and Bolanderi, those are short-lived perennials, really not that much work. In fact, the Bolanderi um, is kind of a thug. It will spread itself around readily in a garden, um, but it is, you know, it's full of sugar and many organisms like sugar. I'm one of them. And so um, it's, uh, you know, I like to have as many facilias as possible in my gardens because it just provides so much uh, flight fuel, as it were. Great. So we have a question on how you control diseases or um, problem insects, especially for fruit trees, um, but still provide all the benefits for the habitats. Again, the answer is to plant lots and lots of species. Remember, the more diversity that you have, the better in balance your garden will be. You run into problems when, with insects when you don't have enough predators. The way to get predators is to provide an abundance of resources. Think about a buffet that only has iceberg lettuce and maybe some cucumbers. You know, that's gonna to appeal to a small crowd, but if you have a, a salad bar, a buffet salad bar, whatever, with, you know, several hot dishes, you know, some, maybe some, maybe some rices, maybe some fruits, maybe some nuts, you know, you're gonna get a crowd. Um, and that's, I mean, it's food, right? So it's all about the meal time. The more you provide in terms of species, it will bring in a huge diversity of predators. And really, you don't, ha you don't have to worry about problem insects if you have enough for everybody. Um, you know, 20 species is good, a good target. Get your keystone species in there first. The big tree um, or trees, uh, the keystone shrubs, and then start layering things in and you'll be surprised at just how good that is. And diseases, you know, plant disease resistant varieties. Um, you know, um, I don't have any problems with our, our fruit trees um, at all, like pesticides or fungicides or herbicide, nothing. I don't use anything on them. I, I do bag up. I do bag up the apples um, because I don't want to uh, put out a sticky trap. We do have worms in those. I think the worms will go in there. And that seems to work pretty well. Uh, fruit bags are a great way to avoid uh, insects inside your fruit. It takes a little bit of work, but it's very satisfying work. Great. I just want to mention to everyone who's still on, um, please feel free to type in a question or raise your hand. Um, we have a couple more to go. So we have a question on where you suggest people um, buy seeds or plants that are native and drought tolerant. So once again, uh, you can go to the calscape.org plant that you want. They will have a list of nurseries where those plants are available. You can click on a link, look at their website. Many of the nurseries have availability lists on their websites. Most of those lists are up to date, sometimes not. Um, and you can also Google native California plant seeds and get them through the mail. I get seeds from companies all over the world. Um, surprising where you find a California native seed. Um, you know, in, here in California, we have a number of different uh, places that you can get them. Southern California seeds you can get from the Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, you can become good friends with people like me who I'm always trying to exchange seeds with people. And uh, there's a one place I like to go. Uh, there's Larner seeds up in Bolinas that I like. There's Seed Hunt um, down in Freedom. There is um, uh, Klamath Siskiyou seeds that are more northerly seeds. There's sacred succulents up in Sebastopol. Um, I, 
I like all of these. They offer different plants and certain, certainly different seeds. Um, you can join societies where people swap seeds, lots of different places to get them. Great. Um, we have a question about um, finding uh, landscape architects that are familiar with uh, habitat gardens. Ah. Well, you know, back in landscape, they didn't really emphasize that. Um, and so there, to find a landscape architect like me who does this sort of thing, we're kind of a rare breed, I think. Um, but there are garden designers who may not be licensed landscape architects who can help you. I know that there are certain nurseries where they offer design services as well as um, native plants. That might be a, an option. You also might try going to the American Society of Landscape Architects. Um, here in California, we have the yeah, the Northern California chain. There are four or five different chapters in California of, of the American Society of Landscape Architects and just search for those um, and see if there are any local in your area. Great. Um, are, have you ever had any problems with rats? I mean, I know you mentioned squirrels with drip irrigation, moles or gophers, and if there are those issues, what do you suggest to, to do? Yes, so um, what I've noticed is that um, when we had a bird feeder, we had a little rat problem. We don't have a bird feeder anymore. Um, and so, like I said, it's all about the meal time, right? So I do have a problem with squirrels. And so what I do to protect plants that I have just planted, especially if I've raised them from seed and nurtured them Long, I will put wire over them or wire baskets upside down. Um, you can get gopher guards uh, for underground as well to um, to guard against them. Physical barriers really are the best things that work against the uh, more determined rodents. We have a question about. If you are wanting some non-native plants, is it better to keep them in like pots instead of putting them outside or putting them on the patio in a pot? Um, if you have a, if you do want a couple non-native plants, yes. it really depends on what the plant is. Um, I do have a select few non-natives in my own garden, but they're there for a specific reason. Um, I don't like things just for their ornamental value, like the orange tree that's there because I like orange juice. Um, the apple trees are there because I like apples. Um, you know, if you like to have seasonal color and you're not really that excited about whatever a native annuals, perhaps you might want to go with some non-native annuals in a pot. Um, or there's maybe a cymbidium orchid that you like or something like that. Those are fine in pots. Some things might like not want to be in pots. Um, and there you run a risk of, um, if it's not in a pot, then you're basically using up square footage for something that's probably an ecological dead end. So a pot is a great way to go. Um, it's certainly easier to dig up later if you want to get rid of the plant. Um, but you know, I, I do have uh, a cymbidium orchid um, in a pot that I like because I've had it for probably about 15 years and it was a gift. Um, but it suffers from my benign neglect. I don't even water it, but it still blooms. So I am not a, a complete purist, but I have at least over 70 species or 70% native species in my yard. So I think if the percentage is high enough a few non-natives are not going to be an issue, but you have to be very careful about the seeds. Um, birds will spread seeds even if they don't blow away on the wind, and some do. You have to think about, are birds going to get in there and spread the seeds around? So, you know, it really depends on what you want uh, for a non-native. Um, again,
Juanita, you cut out there. Okay, um, so I was just saying it really depends on whatever native that was. So, um, you know, go ahead and research it to see, um, you know, if the seeds are going to be carried off by birds or if they're going to blow away in the wind. You know, be mindful. Be, be mindful if that if that's going to get out and infest natural areas. Remember, non-native plants can be tumors in the environment. Yes, definitely want to keep that in mind. Going back to natives, what are some good native vines to grow to cover fences? Ooh, I like this question a lot. I love Lanicera hispidula. Our native uh, honeysuckle it has beautiful pink blossoms. I'm very partial to pink, but you can also get it with orange blossoms as well. Another one is Aristolochia, which is the larval food source for the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. So those are actually two that I have in my yard. Um, other vines, um, I like to have vines crawling up through things. So one of the, the ones I'm experimenting with is Lathyrus vestitis or the, um, our native pea. It has a beautiful, once again, pink blossom. Um, and I have that planted at the base of a shrub, a native shrub, so that it will crawl up through the, through the branches. And um, that particular uh, vine uh, fixes nitrogen. So I have a theory that it's actually helping the shrub that is planted next to. Lots of choices, certainly. How, we have a question about how do you control or remove white grubs from the soil? I don't. <laughs> so those grubs are going to turn into something, whether they're going to be moths or butterflies. Um, and, you know, I just, I don't move bugs around at all. Um, you know, again, I, I think of myself as kind of the caterer and, you know, the bugs are going to have to fend for themselves. If I come across Crossed grubs, eh, you know, that's, they're just protein for something else. And I don't know what, I mean, I run across grubs all the time in soil and I just leave them. Um, something that maybe lives underground will eat them. Maybe when they come out as adults, something will eat them then. So I don't interfere with, with the life cycle of, of insects like that. I try to just provide, you know, a nice, uh, buffet and whoever eats, eats it, eats it, and whoever eats them, eats them. I know you said that you don't think too much um, on the ornamental side, but we do have a question on color um, mm -hmm. and kind of how to have the habitat carding good for the bees, but also colorful. You know, I, I was thinking about this today, and um, there's so much color, <clears throat> so much color in nature um, that <sighs> so, for example, in my own garden, I have the the bright blue penstemon planted amongst an annual uh, Clarkia concina, which has a hot pink flower, which is planted in with a native thistle that has a powder puff pink flower. And um, for me, there's really uh, an embarrassment of riches in terms of color. Um, and I was thinking, my garden kind of looks a little bit like a jungle, but there's a lot of color. One of the best ways to use color is to plant a gigantic mass of something. One flower does not really, unless it's a huge one, it doesn't really have a lot of impact. But if you can plant in masses, um, the visual impact is greater. Um, and there are certainly color combinations that you use. I personally love pink, so I, I'm attracted to pink flowers. Um, but I, I have also yellow flowers in the garden, white flowers in the garden, um, you know, and whenever I'm <clears throat> putting together these talks and I'm doing pulling screenshots from Calscape um, and looking at plants, 
well, I have a confession. I probably ordered about $300 worth of seeds <laughs> because I see so much that I want. Um, I still have seeds from a few talks ago um, that I ordered that I'm not quite sure what I'll do with. But so what I'm saying is that there's so much abundance that you don't really have to worry too much about um, having enough color because there, there is so much color in native plants already, um, you know, and some of it's quite spectacular. Um, and the combinations, especially if things see themselves around your yard, um, I always like to say nature is not vulgar. Um, and you'll have color, but on top of it, there'll be butterflies flying through. There'll be the cutest little bees floating around. There'll be tiny little beetles everywhere, little tiny baby katydids. So you know, don't just get color, but you get other life. It's really the whole package. Going off on the, the seeds conversation, um, we have a question about if you suggest planting the seeds straight in the ground or germinating in small pots first. So if there's a seed that I haven't tried before, I like, or what is called cold moist stratification. And I actually have a YouTube video on my Primrose Way YouTube channel showing how I did that. Um, basically, I put seeds into wet coffee filters, stick them into a plastic bag and put them into the refrigerator and then wait to see how long it takes for them to germinate. I'll put them into a pot so then I can see what they look like so I don't inadvertently weed them out if I were to plant them straight away into the garden. Some plants like to be... Uh, other plants don't. Some are harder, like perennials. Sometimes they don't sprout very quickly. Um, there are certain species of violets that take about six months to germinate. Um, so some seeds come up very fast, others come up after a year or more. Um, so it, it, you have to think, like, which seed is it? If it's an annual, something like Phacelia is going to sprout very quickly. So that goes straight into the garden. Some things like Clarkia amoena, the farewell to spring, that goes straight into the garden. I did try the Clarkia concinna in a pot. It didn't like it. I've spread those into the garden directly and they're doing beautifully. So some, um, so I, I like to become familiar with what I'm doing so I know what's easy and what's not and then go from there. We have a question specifically about your, your business and if you um, will consult on a site in Hillsboro. Um, I'm not currently taking on any new clients. There are other landscape architects that, that do this, um, but um, currently, I'm sorry to say, I'm not uh, doing uh, residential uh, clients at the moment. Uh, to everyone else who's still on, I don't see any other questions, so please type them in or raise your hand now. I know we still got about half the attendees still here, so. Um, I think Juanita is willing to hang around a little longer if you guys have any more questions. We'll wait a couple of minutes, but yeah, you can you can raise your hand yeah, or happy. type it into the Q&A. We got a raised hand. Okay, so, um, oh, Beth? I'm going to allow you to talk, Beth. Beth, can you, um, if you unmute yourself, you can talk. You had a question? Okay. Um, any other questions while we wait for, for that one? Are you planning another new garden in Palo Alto? Why, yes, I am. I'm always scheming um, at places that are not currently planted or places that are filled with ivy, the scourge of mankind. Um, 
as I mentioned before, every town has these areas that are um, underutilized, shall we say. And so um, there are some other places. So at our latest garden that we planted up at the Hopkins uh, Avenue tennis court area, um, there are a few parking bays and then there's a strip along Newell Road uh, adjacent that uh, have ivy in them. And it's ivy underneath some oak trees, which needs to come out. Um, ivy really is an ecological dead end. I did a design um, for uh, the Magic Forest in Rinconada Park. And there's um, along Embarcadero Road coming into Palo Alto. Um, at least in the uh, east end of Embarcadero Road, there are these 10 foot wide, uh, what they call health strips, the area between the sidewalk and the road. Prime real estate, probably acres of land that could be planted up. So lots of opportunities, certainly. Um, I'm always looking for volunteers, by the way. <laughs> um, for any additional ivy or uh, a few weeds. Surprisingly, these gardens have had very little in terms of maintenance. Uh, go out um, much, and um, really the gardens start taking care of themselves. The the weeds. Um, I will pull some of the more egregious ones that are big and easy to grab. Um, but there haven't, there really haven't been a lot to in terms of weeds. So um, the more plants that we put in there, actually, uh, the better the garden runs in terms of being resilient and strong and um, just, you know, the, the connections between the plants just um, make the whole habitat work better. How it works, how all that works is is still a mystery to me, and that's the beauty of it. Great. Um, I for who had asked me about other landscape designers, uh, Bill McCormick wanted to make a note that uh, cnps.scv, the Santa Clara Valley website, has a gardening tab with um, suggested designers. Um, we have a question about plants in high winds in dusty areas along the coast. Does any plants you suggest for that type of terrain? Could you repeat that question? Because you were kind of breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, we have a question about what to plant if it's very windy and dusty. They say they live along windy. the coast. Windy. Oh, well, there are a lot of great coastal type plants that will that will do well. Um, you know, there's it. If you're doing kind of a coastal prairie, um, there are one of my favorite plants, uh, Ariagonum latifolium. Um, a lot of the Erigeron species grow nicely there, um, depending on exposure and things like that. Um, things that are low growing like that um, do quite well. Um, again, you know, get look, look at calscape.org to see for that particular area uh, what is recommended. Some low, lower growing things will probably do better in a windy location. Great. Um, regarding volunteers, Hector wants to know how he can sign up to volunteer with you in Palo Alto. So uh, it's pretty easy to message me through Facebook or Instagram. And um, if you message me through those uh, platforms, then um, you know I'll add you to the uh, to the volunteer email list. And um, I typically go out on Sundays to uh, to do uh, some work um, in some of the gardens. Um, it you know once again right now um, you know with our physical distancing. I haven't had any sort of volunteer days, but, um, you know, in the future, we're certainly, we're certainly going to need more, but uh, message me through uh, either the Facebook 
or the Instagram Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, and I will add you to the volunteer list. Great. And could we add the, the Facebook link to our to our email to everyone? Sure. If they have additional questions. Absolutely. Great. Um what else? Oh, we have a question on following up on the coastal environment, if you suggest anchor tree or what would you suggest for anchor trees? Um, again, so, you know, to, to look on the uh, CalScape website to see what is suggested, um, certainly um, a tree perhaps like Garia elliptica could work well out on the coast. Um, again, I would go and see what is local for the, that area. And, you know, windiness is a, is a fact of life out on the coast. Um, and so that will shape your trees for you. You can try staking them, certainly, um, but they will uh, form sort of the, uh, you know, branches in one direction because of the constant wind. That's just how nature works. Um. I don't see that many other questions. Um, I guess someone's asking if you could repeat your, your Facebook again. Yes, yes. So we, we are on social media, Facebook and Instagram. It's the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. And I also have uh, the Primrose Way YouTube channel. Great. Um, any other questions? We'll wait a couple minutes to see if there's any more questions. You know, I just wanted to leave people with the thought, you know, you get you you get excited about these, um, you know, oh, habitat cards, I have to get out and plant something. Um, you know, if you're feeling ambitious and you want to do something right away, and there's still time to plant this year um, before the hot weather really sets in, is find one keystone species of a tree or a big shrub, plant that first, and then, you know, sit out the hot weather um, because it's really hard to establish plants during the heat. And so um, make some plans for your garden, order up some seeds. You can start growing things from seed now. You just have to keep them, you know, moist. Um, you know, make your garden, and then by the time the rainy season starts, you'll have things ready to go. So um, that, if you're feeling all fired up, that these are good ways to go. Um, and get those blackout drapes up in your windows. Um, you can get blackout fabric actually by the yard on Amazon. It's pretty easy. And, um, you know, don't let your gardeners use those leaf blowers. I would love to see those never used again. Um, you know, they're, they are so bad for the habitat life. It's just really sad. So those are, if you're feeling fired up, that's a good way to start. You think, I've got to get out and plant my garden actually start planning your garden, get on those sites, take a look what works, make a list, make a, make a pallet, get some seeds, plant up some things. You know, if you have extras, give them away, um, start a backyard nursery business, you know. Seeds are incredibly easy um, for the most part. Some are more challenging than others. Like if you wanted to try growing bulbs from seeds, if you have three to five years for that, Um, and I'm just crazy enough to try it. I'm doing that myself. Um, you know, it gives so much to us. You know, it's, it's the bounty that we have here in California. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. And if you're fired up, I say dive in. Great. I guess uh, one last kind of question to end is if you could kind of once again, go over your big three um, keystones. So uh, in terms of keystones, remember trees first 
And you probably, the best trees for keystone species are the salem. The other for shrubs are Ceanothus, Arctostaphylus, and Areogonum. You just can't go wrong with Ceanothus. I love that plant. Lots of fun, fun things about Ceanothus. It's beautiful gets chewed up by insects. The blossoms are beautiful. So nice. Well, I really don't have a favorite, but um, usually what's just starting to bloom is my new favorite, especially if it's pink. Um, we have one last question about, um, there's uh, one attendee is saying that the the gardeners blow the leaves away, but um, do you suggest that they collect them for compost if they can't control um, what, garden, what um, the outside landscapers are doing? I would tell my gardeners no leaf blowers. And um, I mean, for one thing, they're noisy. If they're gas powered, they're uh, polluting the environment. Um, and they're kicking up dust into the air that everybody has to breathe. Um, you know, if you want leaves off of patios and sidewalks, I would say have them use a broom um, and then they can rake the leaves underneath trees and around shrubs um, and instead of blowing them away. Your leaves are valuable. Leaves are like gold. And if you see leaves that way, you won't be having your gardeners bag them up and take them away because you're just losing all that great carbon um, that was transformed from sun and water and nutrients in, and uh, sucked in from the atmosphere just to have it carted away. Why not, why not cycle it through your habitat? Have the gardeners rake those leaves um, into, into a pile. If you want to start a little pile, a pile is a great way to, to get salamanders and other organisms. Um, to trap moisture. You can have a couple of, you could just leave them in place under trees, scoot them off the patio with a broom. Um, yeah. Um, I don't, we have a tiny little bit of lawn left. I don't let the gardeners mow that. I don't, we, we actually stopped our gardening service. And so I actually go out with the, the hand pruners. <laughs> to chop down any little bits of grass that are too tall here and there. Um, but for leaves, you know, it's just, for me, it's just too much work. I just leave them where they fall and get them off the patio with the broom. Yes, leave the leaves. Leave the um, leaves. I'm not seeing any other questions. If you do have a question, please type it in now. Um, I know it's almost nine o'clock, so thank you so much, Renita, for staying on an hour later, and thank you to everyone who's joined us. We had a hundred attendees, which is like really wow. exciting. That's awesome. Um, and this recording will be available on the Bosco website, and we will also send out uh, the link to Juanita's Facebook page, and you can contact her through that or Instagram. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Please join us for the workshop we're holding on June 1st about edible gardening. And please look forward to the other Basta classes. Um, oh, uh, we have one last question about what you were saying with the moving leaves around with um, a broom, if it's okay to move leaves from one location to a different location. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I have a, a nice pile of leaves um, in one back corner of the garden. Um, and it is actually next to my thimbleberry plant, which spreads by runners. And guess where those runners are going? Right to the pile. But I do love thimbleberries, so I'm hoping that I'll get a harvest at some 
some point when it, the plant gets big enough. But yeah, feel free to move them around. Leaves are valuable in your habitat. You know, they're, they are part of the, of all of those components that we talked about at the beginning. They're part of the nesting, they're part of the food. And the moisture. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Anita. And as she said before, it's, you can get started with those, researching those key species right now. Um, any, any other last, last words, Anita? Yes, um, one last thing is like, don't be intimidated by it. Um, if you start small with a, with a couple of these keystone species, then you're off and running. I mean, there's really no wrong way to do it unless you spray pesticides all over everything. Um, but don't be intimidated by it. It's like one of the best things that you can possibly do for your property and for the nature that will explode into resilient. Everybody can do this. And I think that people will be very surprised to see just the life that comes to their gardens when you provide an abundance of resources. Yes, I think that's great, great way to end the talk tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Renitza, for um, teaching us all this valuable um, information about natives and what we can do at home. And like I said, please look out for the recording on the Bosco website and please join us for future classes. Um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.